Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little Another name that I've heard all throughout, you know, my lifetime, and I'm excited to understand a little bit more about him. Low key, my boss. Uh, who apparently had more power than the mayor. I'm talking about Carlo Gambino. Talk to me about how uh, he became one of the most notorious mob bosses in history. Yes, the secretive boss. Uh, Carlo Gambino is an interesting character. You know, he really flew under the radar throughout his whole mob career for the most part. Um, what really fascinates me about Carlo is you know, he was a mafioso through and through. Um, and what many other mobsters can't say, Carlo could. He was a made man in Sicily at 19 years old. Um, so you could imagine what kind of jobs he was working for the mob out in Sicily in his younger days. Um, and he would really grow into what was one of the many inspirations for Don Vito Corleone in The Godfather. Um, a lot of people try to set their finger on one inspiration for Don Vito, but I think it's a combination of a bun- bunch of uh, mob bosses, but that's for another time too. Um, so of course, Carlo is well known for being very secretive. Um, and like I said, he was made in Sicily at 19 years old. So he was destined to become the legendary mob boss that he does. Um, he came to the United States in 1921 illegally. Uh, stowed away in a ship and landed in Norfolk, Virginia, where I believe he was met by his cousins, the Castellanos, who one of them most specifically would be Paul Castellano, which would be his underboss and later his successor, who would be infamously whacked by John Gotti at Spark Steakhouse in New York City. Um, and Don, Corley, or excuse me, uh, Don Gambino. Of course, not the Don yet, but he was highly respected instantly upon arrival, um, settling in Brooklyn. And he would jump right into Salvatore de Aquila's organization in New York City and make a lot of money bootlegging, just like many other gangsters did during the Prohibition era. Um, and in the shadows, he would be a part of that young Turk group that I had mentioned before um, in the Bugsy Siegel piece, really looking to overthrow the current regime of the mob called the mustache Pete's who had an old school mentality. You know, they didn't believe in, um, working with other mobs. They, you know, Joe, the boss, Mazaria, for example, didn't want to work with people. He just, he, he really, if he could have, he would have taken over the whole country's rackets. Um, he really believed that everywhere was his territory and these guys didn't like that. So, um, Carlo Gambino saw, you know, potential in that alliance with Lucky and these young Turks and saw that as the future of organized crime. And, you know, he knew he would benefit from that alliance with those guys. And um, eventually he would, you know, orchestrate a key role in the, you know, the Castle of Marese war and getting rid of these bosses, Joe the boss and Salvatore Maranzano. And um, he would become a heavyweight in the, newly formed one of the five families headed by Vincent Mangano, which would be the Mangano crime family. Um, and he, Mangano would control that family for a while. Um, and his underboss was Albert Anastasia, another uh, notorious figure in mafia history. And he would eventually, you know, take over the family by having Mangano and his brother, Philip killed, um, and he would have no choice but to appoint the young and upcoming Carlo Gambino as his underboss. And this was another situation where Gambino remained silent. Uh, I believe there was a few instances where Albert Anastasia disrespected Carlo in front of a bunch of guys and Gambino didn't really, you know, react to it much. He kind of just kept to himself, but he knew what was going to happen in the future. And he teamed up with Vito Genovese while secretly teaming up with guys like Lucky Luciano again and Frank Costello. Um, This is around like the 50s. um, To take over his um, 
family now from Albert Anastasia, who was really bringing a lot of heat to the mob. Um, and you know, Albert Anastasia would infamously get whacked in the, in the, uh, barber shop, um, in New York city. And, you know, there's a lot of disputes over that, uh, who, what, who the hit squad was, what the order was, or who gave the orders. Um, I'm pretty sure it was the, um, behind the scenes. It was Carlo Gambino had a lot to do with that. And out with Albert out of the way, Gambino is where he was destined to be. And he becomes boss in 1957 after Albert Anastasia gets assassinated. And like I said, he's always operating in the darkness. He didn't really have much of a national name. His name would come up in papers here and there, but nothing to, you know, give him that notorious reputation like his predecessor, Albert Anastasia, did and some of his other former mob partners. Um, and around, uh, you know, he would, excuse me, to rewind a little bit, he was also a part of a lucrative ration stamp operation during world world war two. And that made him a lot of money too. And that put him, um, in a strong position. And, and what was really important to know about Gambino was that he was a huge earner. Okay. And that was really why, you know, he was respected right away. Other than the fact that he was made at 19, which is unheard of. Um, but he would as boss expand his family massively into the sixties. And, Another important thing about Gambino that made him so powerful was that his son actually married the daughter of Tommy Lucchese, another fellow boss of the five family of the five family New York family, um, and they really combined to, you know, control most of New York City's organized crime with this alliance and this family allegiance. Um, and with the arrest of Vito Genovese, the retirement of Joe Bonanno, and a few other of the major players like Lucky, uh, excuse me, Tommy Lucchese dying um, in 1959, <clears throat> Carlo Gambino is now finds himself at the top of New York City's rackets and is established as the boss of bosses. And you know. He really would go on to make, like, apparently his family about five hundred million dollars a year, all while ruling in with an yeah, all while ruling with an iron fist in silence. Um, no attempts on his life. They say that agents and authorities would be, you know, monitoring his house and stuff like that, and they could never get anything on him. And he would still operate his family with no problem. And that's another point about Carlo Gambino and his secrecy that really just distinguishes him from other bosses. Um, and I forgot to mention too, that his, that wedding that I said before between his son and Tommy Lucchese's daughter was another scene out of the Godfather. Um, and that wedding took place in 1962. So that, that's interesting to note. Like I said before, there's a lot of, different inspiration for the Godfather. People try to put their finger on one person and I think it's impossible. Uh, I think it's a whole bunch of different people, but yep, he would control his family all the way up until his death in 1976 while watching his favorite team, the new New York Yankees. And he would appoint his cousin, Paul Castellano as his boss or as the new boss while he was on his deathbed. And another scene from out of the Godfather was his lavish and famous funeral where there were 2,000 mourners. But, you know, if, if you're going to take one thing away about the life of Carlo Gambino, I would say, of course, he emerged as one of the boss of bosses in New York history and really as one of the most powerful mob bosses ever, but really, you know, working in the shadows. Unlike many other mob bosses, he was not... He didn't have the same notorious reputation as some of the guys before him. He was very secretive. Mm. And one thing that I found interesting about him, and I, and I want to ask you if this is common in the mob, but I understand he was 100% against the sale of heroin and cocaine, uh, going as far as to make a rule that anyone caught Dylan would meet their certain death. Yep. It, it, was that just him, or is that like a, 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 was that a, has that always been a mob thing? 
Well, I have my I have my theory on that. Um, you kind of hear about that from some of the old school mob guys, specifically like Carlo Gambino saying that. I kind of think they said that to get the you know hysteria off their back from you know public outcry as well as the um, pressures from police and stuff like that because you know uh, that the war on drugs has always been around whether you know it's um, what's the word I'm looking for apparent or not um, that's that was declared in like 1915 the mob has really not of late but through the really up to like the late mid to late sixties, the mob controlled the drug trade. Uh, whether you, you know, I, I almost call it a myth um, that the mob wasn't in uh, to drugs. I think Carlo kind of just made that a, a known. So, you know, he said it maybe to put some fear into his guys. Yeah, to not do it, but they were doing it, and that made him a lot of money, whether he wanted to admit it or not. Um, and I could name you a couple guys that I know that were under his wing that were involved in drugs um for example i believe i mentioned them on your show before a huge dealer was a guy by the name of tony granza they called him tony scunge and he actually cohorted with bumpy johnson's mob and they controlled the drug trade in broadway and parts of manhattan other parts of manhattan in the bronx and harlem um and that was a huge operation that lasted for a little while and that's not the only one. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think, I think, uh, in my opinion, Carlo kind of just said that as a front in a sense, I think he knew that he was making a lot of money from drugs, but, uh, he kind of just wanted to take the heat off of his family and the mob in general. <laughs> 